Channel, we're doing an early broadcast for us today. Usually Matthew and I come on at like midnight our time, but we have a special guest all the way from Belgium, Mr. Bruno Bruno Putzes. How you doing, Bruno? Thank you very much. I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm I'm happy to have you here. Guys, if you don't know who Bruno is, um, he's kind of like the Floyd Tool and Sean Olive of amplifiers. This is one of the most premier amplifier designers in our industry for the last couple of decades. In fact, Bruno, you probably don't remember this, but about like 15 or 20 years ago when I was just getting started with Audioholics, you wrote a couple of articles debunking cable nonsense for us. And it was through a mutual friend, Dan Banker, who is no longer with us, that we were introduced. But... Um, yeah, so you have a couple of articles on Audioholics dealing with cable distortion or the lack thereof. Do you remember that? I, I actually uh, actually do. I remember that period um, uh, quite quite vividly because I was I was bored witless at Phillips. Uh, it was sort of the the the, the final f final weeks of my time there, and uh, before I decided to go because I was at, I, I had nothing to do. And so I spent those final f final weeks to, uh, to to kind of study the, the the most the most off the wall things that I could think of. Well, I'm glad that we kept you entertained. Um, another thing that Bruno Bruno's been around in this industry for a long time. He started with the Class D module for Hypex. He's the one that came up with that awesome amplifier design. He's also with another brand called Key Speakers. I believe is that how you say it? That's Key. Yeah, correct. And key speakers are like an active, an active speaker, like a studio monitor, and it uses some of your amplifier and DSP technology. Uh, yes, the uh, it's it, it's it's an active speaker that's so, sort of its um, its primary claim to fame is that it is is that it uh, uses a form of active beam steering, so so that it directs the sound towards the, the towards listeners. So it's uh, it, it uses drivers that are sort of, that are peppered around the, uh, the the cabinet, not just on the front, but also on the side and on the back, and then and then driven in with particular and phase relationship, so that you get a get a null on the uh, on, on on the rear of the speaker. It's it's not just for studios, by the way. I mean, it's the size is ideal for, for, for studio work, but we sell about half of our speakers to consumers. Nice. Okay, well, we're going to look further into that brand because it looks like you have some interesting designs. So today I want to talk, I want to focus on the topic amplifier feedback. And guys, if the audio is breaking up, it's not us, it's StreamYard. That's the uh, software that we're using to do the stream. I'm going to be uh, sending in another complaint because this is the second time we've had this audio dropout problem. Somebody suggested maybe it's the it's the cables we need to use audio quest cables. <laughs> maybe that's the case. Maybe there's distortion in cable after all. So, anyways, um, probably one of the biggest myths in amplifiers among audio files is that negative feedback or too much of it is bad. And you know, in my engineering time when I was in school, we learned all about control systems and amplifier feedback. In fact, I designed an amplifier for my senior project that used global and local feedback. And I had some problems, I'll be honest with you. I was a student. My amplifier went a little unstable when it drove a low impedance load. So after that project was done and, and, it, and I passed the class, I started seeing the stuff pop up in the audio field about people saying too much feedback is bad. And I remember back in the day when I had like a Pioneer receiver from the 80s, it was the VSX 4500S, I believe. Um, I thought it was a great receiver because it had 0 0.00, 7% THD plus N, so it was super low distortion. But then I brought home, because I worked for a hi-fi shop when I was in college, I brought home a, a Rotel amplifier that had maybe 0.03% published distortion. And I could not believe how much be better the Rotel amplifier sounded than my Pioneer receiver. The bass was much more controlled. There was just much better clarity in the amplifier. And then it had me thinking, well, maybe, maybe feedback is a bad thing, because too much feedback can cause maybe uh, too much ringing or just all these other artifacts that you can't account for because maybe lower distortion isn't better that was kind of going on in my head even though my engineering education kind of taught me otherwise and it wasn't until i started really looking into this topic more and i started doing my own measurements of amplifiers with my audio precision and then of course i ran into you that i realized well maybe feedback isn't dirty maybe it's just most people don't know how to implement it correctly so I definitely want to hear your talk on this topic. We have a slideshow presentation that you present 
presented to us here that we're going to be showing to our audience. So let me open this up and then you can kind of give us a rundown of uh, feedback. And while I'm doing that, maybe why don't you define what the purpose of amplifier feedback is? Well, the, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the purpose of, of feedback in, uh, in most, uh, most analog electronics is, uh, is, is really to, uh, to, to, to get around the problem that, uh, that, that you, that, that, uh, number of circuit functions that you can't just do with passive parts so it's not just gain gain, gain is one thing of course that you you cannot do with passive parts but there are also certain types of um, uh, types of filters that you cannot not simply do with resistors and and and, and capacitors but what but what you can do is you can you, you can do the opposite of what it is that you want to achieve and put that that as a feedback loop around say an operational amplifier and that will result in exactly what what you wanted. So a feedback loop is basically something that does the that 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 does the opposite of of whatever it is that you that you place in the in, in the feedback. So the, uh, the like like the circuit that's on the, on your uh, on the title slide, that's uh, that's an amplifier with an attenuator around the uh, 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 around the amplifier in a in a feedback loop. And the result is that you get precisely defined gain. So what the amplifier can do, it cannot provide precise gain, but it can provide lots of it. What the attenuator can't do is provide gain, but it can attenuate very precisely. You combine the two and you get a precise amplifier. That's the that's the basic so, generic So if I idea. remember correctly, looking at the schematic, this is a non-inverting amplifier where the gain of it is one plus R2 over R1, right? Yes, that's uh, that, that, that that's correct. So um, so so basically, These because the, the feedback phase. yeah exactly because uh, the, the 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 thing that's in the triangle that's supposed to be just uh, just a ton of gain, um, which means that uh, that what goes into it is uh, is is going to be really really small, and that's the difference between your input voltage and the attenuated output voltage. So if your output voltage is attenuated by a factor of two, so say these two resistors are equal, then uh, then that, then then so, so, sort of what what's, what gets fed back is half the output voltage, and then this that, then this this amplifier will just will, will will try to steer its output in such a way that it keeps the difference between half the output voltage and uh, and the input voltage to, uh, to 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 the smallest possible value, and the way it does that, of course, is by creating an output voltage which is exactly twice the input voltage. And Bruno, while you're talking about this, there's some folks who are asking about what about advanced class D? So everything you're sharing today with us would apply to all amplifier topologies, correct? Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, with uh, l let's say with uh, with exception of uh, of Tim, because class D doesn't have Tim, uh, so, uh, so so that that's that's specific to uh, to linear amplifiers. But otherwise, basically. Feedback is it, it, control theory in general. That's just uh, that that that's that's just the, the the thing that keeps your that keeps your 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 car running at uh, at at a constant speed when you when you put the cruise control on. It's actually uh, it's actually what keeps your, your your car following following the lane. But in that case, you're part of that feedback loop. Uh, it's even what make what makes you stand up straight without falling over. Um, so, so, so feedback is an extraordinarily generic subject, and we're going to, of course, we're, we're going to drill it down to audio specifically. But, uh, but, but just to remind people that feedback is 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 just just one of one of the most basic processes in life. So, in this slide, you're talking about the feedback phobia, which was started in the '70s, and I think kind of went on into the '80s. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's probably still going on, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is still is. Yeah, I didn't realize this until you put this in a slideshow that um, in those early stage, early days of amplifiers, I thought that when they've applied feedback, it was for the entire bandwidth. But you're saying here that it was mostly low frequency feedback that they didn't do good controls over the amplifier for the full bandwidth. Mm, that's right. Uh, the the uh, so, so, so this this is illustrated um, uh, in 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 the graph that you posted with uh, sort of the, the the short rundown that that, uh, that that we published on your on your website. Uh, the, the the basic problem is that um, is that the uh, the the amplifier 
um, the, uh, the, the amplifier cannot respond instantaneously. Um, it can only, well, obviously it can only respond, uh, re respond after the fact, but it can also only make, make further adjustments to its initial response when it sees the output react. Um, and 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 that, that's that's when you see the fundamental uh, problem is is I mean especially when we when we're looking back to um, to the 70s the, the power stages were not particularly fast um, so so the so so that so the power stage responded to uh, to to, uh, to 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 something the amplifier wanted to do did so quite uh, quite slowly and of course if if you then if if you then try to force it to react uh, react more quickly, uh, you'll get oversteering like you get in a car. It becomes it becomes com co completely unstable once you once you start reacting too too quickly. So you have to have to react kind of gently, and you have to react within a in, in, in let, let, let's say with a with a within a time span that's compatible with uh, with, with the speed with which your output stage can uh, can can uh, can react. Now, if you do that with, let's say, the, the simplest uh, possible feedback loop, um, and that's uh, that, that's uh, using an, an amplifier that we call an integrator, um, then that automatically means that 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 essentially the amount of feedback that you get available is um, uh, decreases uh, inversely proportional with frequency. Meaning that if you have a, a fairly bog standard power stage from the 70s, which would which would struggle to get much past 200 kilohertz, then at that point, at 200 kilohertz, you have no feedback at all. You just uh, you just have to, to live with what the power stage does. At 20 kilohertz, you've got you, you've got 10 times feedback, i 20 dB. That's uh, that's uh, that that that's not a lot. And then only at two kilohertz, you get 40, and at and at 200 hertz, you get you get 60, and so on. Um, but that was a bit confusing because uh, because um, uh, because people thought that these amplifiers had a massive amount of feedback. Well, only if you look at the very low frequency end of the of uh, of the graph. But uh, but the basic simple feedback loop, as it was understood in those days, um, was, uh, was 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 Simply very well, very much beholden to that iron law of uh, of gain times bandwidth is a, is 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 a is a fixed number, and that's equal to uh, to, to the speed of your power stage. Um, and it's 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 only later that, uh, that 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 sort of engineers not only sped up the power stages, but more importantly, figured ways of getting more feedback in in into uh, in, into a um, into a limited bandwidth. Do you think um, that um, these older amplifiers, is this why we had slew-induced distortion problems at high frequencies? Is it because of the, uh, the, the switch, the uh, power, the output stages themselves didn't have enough bandwidth to, to apply the proper feedback out? Up to 20 kilohertz. Uh, it's 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 basically it's it, it, it's basically that. Um, uh, basically, the way you have to uh, you have to look at it is uh, is well, mentally take the amplifier apart and remove the feedback loop because that's easier to uh, to, to sort, sort of forget the feedback loop for a second. Just think backwards from uh, for, from the amplifier. So say the amplifier is somehow magically more or less producing the audio signal that you uh, that that you want. And then look at the at the the input stage of the amplifier, which is like your two transistors with uh, with the emitters uh, coupled together into a into a common uh, common bias source. That's that's your differential input. And of course, the input voltage that you see there is uh, is going to be equal to the output voltage that the amplifier is putting out at that point, divided by the gain that you have. Now, at 20 kilohertz, if you only have if 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 you only have a, have a gain of, uh, of, of 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 say 100, so that's that's that, that's 10 times feedback plus 10 times just uh, just actual gain after feedback. So if you have have like 100, and your amplifier is putting out uh, 20 volts RMS on the uh, on 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 the on the output. That's 200 millivolts R R RMS across the two input transistors. Now at that point, the input transistors. Uh, I mean, with this extreme example, the input transistors will simply cut out completely. On um, so, so the problem is 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 really a classical type of amplifier with your two input transistors in a diff pair, 
uh, and, and, and so on, assumes that there is enough gain to keep the input voltage so small that the input stage stays linear. But if you haven't got that gain because the output stage is, 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 is too slow, then hey, what? You're, you're, you're going to, to overstress your input stage and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and it will start distorting. So, so the distortion is actually caused by the fact that the amplifier, that the amplifier didn't have enough gain in the, uh, in, 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 in the audio range. Now, um, I have to make fun of Gene a little bit. On this slide, we were talking about how CR times P, that's the mathematical formula for limited. <laughs> what was that again, Bruno? <laughs> um, do, do, I, do, do I have to say, uh, have to, have no, to say that? You don't have to say it out loud. Everybody can probably figure out what well, that's actually supposed to be. <laughs> but but, but you, had, you had me, you, I mean, you had me stumped for a couple of seconds when he, when he said that. <laughs> CR yeah, times P, like where, where, where on earth did I write that? Final. Yeah, that, that's my bad. I was looking this over late last night and I was like, CR times P, I, I got to go back to that and see what that means. Is it capacitance <laughs> resistance times pi? I don't know what he's trying to do there. Yeah. Totally went above my head. Uh, it was like a Monty Python moment for a second. Um, okay, so here's the funny thing about this is I know there's a huge market on eBay and just in the audio community in general of people that just go crazy for these vintage amplifiers like these old Marantz 1970s receivers and they they sell for three to five times more than their retail and and, and they 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 sound good i've heard some of these vintage receivers but this is not state-of-the-art amplification by today's standards I'm, I'm not sure people realize how amplifier technology has evolved over the last few decades from what you're talking about here how much better that the output devices have gotten to allow for a much more linear response for the full bandwidth and not just have linearization at low frequencies like you're talking about with this with the problems we're seeing here with distortion caused by not too much feedback but too little feedback mm. yeah well i think i think in the case of vintage amplifiers there's there's the Bound to be quite uh, the, the, the uh, bound to uh, to be a fair bit of youth sentiment. I mean, it's 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 is is like some of us some of us drive the kind of car that we can finally afford twenty years after the fact and that sort of thing. So I, so, uh, since we're on the slide, Bruno, when you and I were talking, I put the slide together because you and I were discussing the amplifiers that people were referring to as the really high feedback amp, and actually every one that I posted here, it turned out. The advertising talked about how they were low feedback designs for better sound quality. And yet, I think sometimes people point to these as the examples of the high feedback amps that sounded bad but had really good specs. And you pointed out probably the specs are not as good as they seem on paper. Well, it's, 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 probably, it's probably a mixed bunch. Um, I, I, um, it's, I, I, I think in the case, uh, what, what's going on here is, is a is a bit more is a bit more subtle than that. Well, the, f the first thing was that 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 you you digging out these amplifiers and their their sales literature was was for me quite uh, quite an eye opener because I I'd sort of imagined that the uh, that the proverbial high feedback amplifier were, were an eighties thing and then, then then you came up with an amplifier from the eighties, which was from the early eighties, which was was already well, at least the, the leaflet was already extolling the benefits of using as little feedback as possible. Um, now uh, the, the the, the the interesting thing there is that the uh, that that the the amplifier that you, that that you sent me the the info about is one that I had at home, and it actually sound it sounded very respectable. I have to uh, I, I have to say, and the measurements that were quoted were actually surprisingly good for those those days. So what I think actually happened there was something else. Um, and that is that these that 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 by the eighties, on the one hand, um, uh, let's say that the marketing folks had uh, had had decided that, um, that that it was not a good thing to advertise um, using a lot of feedback. Um, but on the other hand, the engineers had figured out how to cram more feedback into uh, into a given a given bandwidth by combining some local feedback and some global feedback. And that then got kind of reworded, remarketed as uh, as as being oh, it's only just a little bit of global feedback and mostly uh, and, and mostly local. Yeah, I mean that's just one way of doing that. But a bit of local feedback and a bit of global feedback combined together—that's a, a lot of feedback. And so these amplifiers were sort of were, were 
that A, measured fine, B, didn't sound too bad either, uh, and a lot of feedback, but on the sly, no no one would, would, dare, would have dared to say it in the open that they were actually using a lot of feedback. So that, that is really interesting. Yeah. So it turns out maybe the amplifiers that were already starting to advertise these low feedback designs were in fact high feedback designs in disguise by making use of a mix Correct. of local and global feedback. Yeah. Um, it, it was interesting to me. I didn't look it up to try to prove anything. I looked it up because I was looking for pictures and examples that we could use in the presentation and was finding all this this literature going back. I mean, I think that Denon amp on the right there came out like the year I was born. I think it was like 1981. Uh, so I've just given away my age for folks <laughs> curious. Yeah, well, that, that's that's the amp that we had. We had, I think, we had maybe a, maybe one model down or something. Yeah, yeah. it's a, the, the specs were really good on it, but yeah, they were mentioning you know all of them talked about feedback in some way. You know, some talked about using a modest amount. Uh, some actually said they were using very low feedback designs. The distortion and noise specs were like better than most amps today, actually, in many cases. Yeah, there, there you go. It's 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 simply sort of the 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 myth that at that point was already being uh, be, being morphed um, uh, in in order to uh, to to sell some to to sell a different story. Mm -hmm. All right, Gene, we can probably move on. Yeah. So one question I have for you, Bruno, is um, when I measure amplifiers with my audio precision. Um, they, most amplifiers generally have a good distortion spectra when you do an FFT at one watt. But once you get near its rated power, and I'm talking about levels be before the rails run out of voltage, before you actually clip the amplifier, some amplifiers get really nasty harmonics. Is that a, a result of not having enough feedback? And I'm just talking about doing a one kilohertz FFT. You, usually, you, uh, the, usually that would be uh, that that, uh, that 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 would be uh, a reason. Um, I mean, the uh, the the, the things I, I, I sort of I have I have a vague inkling that that I know that that, that that I know one specific amplifier that you might be referring. To. It is an amplifier that's being sold as 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 not using a lot of feedback and probably indeed doesn't use a lot. Yeah. Um, but uh, but. The thing is, semiconductors just are in themselves not not particularly linear, unless you use them in very very specific ways. And for instance, uh, uh, some some people might have, uh, have 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 an almost sort of religious belief that they should build a, an amplifier out of MOSFETs exclusively. But actually, uh, MOSFETs. Um, uh, although they, they 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 don't draw any DC current on the in in the gate, they have uh, they they have very nonlinear uh, 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 capacitances between uh, b b between gate and and drain especially, um, and those will manifest themselves particularly when you when when you start to uh, to, to to swing the gate hard or the the drain hard, so it's it's. It's it's a mix of things. I think in this case, the mere lack of feedback might not have been uh, be, been the sole reason, but, uh, but but also simply that the, that the circuit in its own right didn't the, didn't have particularly low distortion without feedback. Hmm. Okay. So what's going on in this graph here that you that you show? Uh, this graph was actually the one where where I tried to to explain to some degree. Um, uh, what what it actually what, what, how we actually get get to, uh, to to this this concept that I uh, that I mentioned the, uh, the 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 integrator so um, so you've got this this uh, this tiny little circuit on the bottom of the of, 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 of the drawing showing an amplifier where I've cut out the uh, the actual input signal uh, but I've only added in a distortion source um, so that's what we do in control theory very very often is uh, is we just treat distortion as as an input, um, and then that uh, that's that's added into the output just before before the signal leaves the amplifier. Then you take feedback into uh, in into your your in, into your amplifier, and then we start tracing what sort of voltages that we that we see. 
And what we know is that the, the output stage, which is the sort of the triangle without, without any lettering in it, that thing is, as I said, is kind of slow. So it, put, put it bluntly, it, so the output is delayed compared to the input. So which means that the, that the bit that will control it, which is the, 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 fir the, the first triangle, should initially respond very gently and then make further and further and further course corrections. So the question is like, what sort of a circuit is that? Well, if you look at the graph, then you see that then you see that on uh, that that the that that the the, the the output signal of that that block, which is uh, which which is the the, the, the which is the the the, the, the blue curve, uh, initially responds to the to the to the to the feedback signal, which is the output signal. Very. Um, by doing almost nothing, so the output, so the error signal jumps from say zero to one. The output signal jumps from zero to one as well, and the correction signal slowly starts moving down. And by the end of the whole process, process, what you have is that that the uh, that the output is back to zero because you've you, you've not correctly uh, correctly compensated for the error. Um, and uh, meaning that the input signal into the in, in, into the amplifier is, has become zero, and still it's got an output signal which is minus the the, 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 the error. So you've got something that has very little gain in the very short run and a lot of gain in the long run, meaning a lot a little gain at high frequencies and a lot of gain at low frequencies. And that's the that that's that's where the whole idea comes from. Like like well, the fundamental building block of any feedback system is an integrator, is something which has a lot of gain um, um, over long time spans and very little gain over short time spans. Gotcha. Okay. It's interesting that note about the Class A amplifiers of the eighties had lots of feedback. I, I, didn't even know that. I always thought that those were the simplest designs and, and just relied on the transistor being on all the time to give you low distortion. Maybe if they're yeah. made by Nelson Pass, then they might be low feedback. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, the uh, yeah, but, but if even if you look at the very basic, even if you look at the very basic t type of amplifier circuit, sort of the the the, the, the sort of the, the op amp, so to, so to speak, you've got your diff pair, and then you've got you've got one transistor that that's that that that, that sort of Produces the, the the whole signal swing and then the output stage. Well, that middle transistor has a has a, has a little capacitor strapped between the base and the uh, and the collector, and that capacitor is actually the one that 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 that, that you use to 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 set the uh, the, the the speed of the integration, i.e. The, the the gain bandwidth product. That's set by that single capacitor there. So it's 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 well hidden, but uh, but uh, but but the the integrator is just uh, is is is. Is very explicitly present in that circuit. Now, is it common? I, I remember back in the '90s, I had a, an amplifier from Aragon, I believe. Um, I forgot who the designer was, Michael something, Prozniak or something like that. Um, I remember looking at the circuit on that, and they use an active servo for global feedback. Is that something that's still being done in amplifier design? Is that, or is it? Well, a servo circuit is 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 simply is simply the exact uh, the, the, the 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 exact same feedback circuit and servo circuit are, are synonymous. But usually, what I what what I do find is that people use this in audio use the term servo specifically when they when they apply feedback at super low frequencies in order to get rid of DC at the input without actually having to put in a coupling capacitor. Yeah. Oh. Uh so they don't put a couple of capacitor in series with the stages. They do it as more as a, like a level shift circuit. Yeah, basically they, they 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 simply measure over a very long time what the what the average output uh, output signal is, and then they uh, they, they, they 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 feed that back into uh, it, into the input. And uh, and 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 it's and if you if you do that well, you can you 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 can indeed uh, get get a, get a slightly better result than with a coupling capacitor. So it's it's. You know what's interesting about that comment is I've noticed when I do FFTs on amplifiers, if I do one at one watt versus full power, you can see the DC level goes way up at full power on some amplifiers. Is that just because they didn't properly uh, DC couple or, or 
get basically get rid of the offsets. I, I, I have to say, yeah, I, I, I have to say that that that, that, that strikes me as, uh, as 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 rather pathological when 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 when, when, a, when an amplifier does that. So a DC shift um, is is always associated somewhere somehow with an uh, with uh, an uh, with with an even uh, a distortion uh, an even order distortion source um because uh, b because when when you have like a, like an even order uh, nonlinearity the the mixed product is like the, the like the, the, the like the first frequency plus the second frequency and the first frequency minus the the, sec the, the second frequency now you can also take that view when you think of um when when you think of a single signal and then the second harmonic is simply the single that that single frequency plus itself and that single frequency minus itself is dc so so the dc shift is essentially uh, the zeroth harmonic distortion so to uh, so to speak um but uh, but but normally that should never be so large as to be noticeable is it something that is a concern in terms of affecting the audio performance of an amplifier, or is it just kind of like a safe measure that you don't want to put DC into a speaker? Well, yeah, I would, I would definitely, uh, definitely worry about the, the speaker side. I mean, not so much that that it, 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 speakers don't burn that easily, but uh, but the thing is, uh, most speakers these days are, are vented cabinets. Um, and you don't need a lot of DC to uh, uh, to, to, to off center the, uh, the the woofer significantly and, and actually get get, get a significantly higher distortion out of the woofer as a result of a small DC shift. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's you know, I so on, that, on that account I would avoid it. I wonder if that could can that sometimes cause um, speakers to to misalign or bottom out more so than putting too much power into them, but maybe putting too much DC into the voice coil. I never really thought about that. Is that something that could cause over a long period of time more damage to the speaker than just maybe overdriving it with too much power? No, I wouldn't really expect a lot of lot of damage. I mean, uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe how how uh, how physically robust loudspeakers actually are. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so that's it's 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 really more it's really more a matter of just the speaker not not functioning properly while there is a lot of DC going on. But then again, vented cabinets have have their own quirks. Um, they've got this. They've got one of those those second order distortion mechanisms inherent in the uh, in, in the vent. So actually, quite a, quite a few a few of those speakers will will themselves off center at uh, when you play loud bass through them. So it's with, so then the amplifier doesn't even have to help. And I I just want to make sure because I bet our audience doesn't have any idea what we're talking about right now. And I just want to make clear with a little bit of a visual here. So when you're talking about the effects of DC offset raising distortion on the woofer, a woofer typically sits where it's supposed to by design, which allows for well as linear as the design allows a BL curve back and forth. Uh, because it's expected to be in that sort of center position. And they often are slightly off center, but that's all, again, part of the design. When you uh, put a DC offset on the amp, it pushes the woofer in, in the outward direction, typically by a certain amount equal to whatever that DC offset is, meaning that the woofer is naturally now sitting in a different center than it was designed. And that raises distortion now as it moves in and out in that new position. Yeah, I mean, you, you only have a certain range in which it can in which it can move, and you're eating up some of that range by by pushing it into the corner. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So this is interesting. I, I think probably if you could give a quick um, definition of what TIM distortion is versus THD, because here's the myth that I've seen audiophiles use. They say that amplifiers are all measured with THD plus N, but if you look at their TIM, then some amplifiers fall on their face. Whereas in my experience, if you've got really good low THD across the entire bandwidth of the amplifier, then your TIM should be good as well. So maybe give a little um, a little definition of what TIM is, and, and if I'm correct with that, or is that a myth in itself? Well, no. I mean, you're you're absolutely right that uh, that 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 Tim is 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 uh, not particularly mysterious. Um, the only the the the, so the only thing that makes that that, that makes Tim uh, nastier than 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 uh, than other uh, than, than other harmonic distortion um, mechanisms is the um, is the fact that it that it happens outside the feedback loop. As I said, it happens on in the input stage, so the amplifier simply 
confuses that, that distortion signal for input signal and faithfully amplifies it. Um, and the um, uh, and 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 so the 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 effect is particularly noticeable when you have a more complex uh, sig uh, uh, signal being being presented in the um, to you to, uh, uh, at the input, um, and because then you get so you get uh, intermodulation distortion at lower frequencies, which is not at all being attenuated by the uh, by, by by the feedback loop, but um, nevertheless, it's definitely true that if you measure an amplifier with uh, with, with uh, uh, a high frequency sine wave, and you ha and you get very low distortion, then that must imply that that Tim is also uh, is also low as well. It's uh, it's so there's there's nothing mythical about Tim that 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 that's that somehow that that that's, that somehow makes it escape uh, the, the notice of an ordinary harmonic. Uh, measurement. I think. I think typically, t typically people on the pseudoscientific fringe, they like to to su to suggest that some sorts of distortions aren't measurable. Well, Tim is eminently measurable. It's uh, and it's actually a very straightforward mechanism uh, uh, at that. And funnily enough, it's it's not caused by feedback at all, but it's also not helped by feedback, unfortunately. Got you. Okay, so it's an input stage problem. It's not part of the feedback loop, like you're saying here in the slide. Yeah, correct. And but but the the, the crazy thing about it is, of course, as I said, as I as I said, the 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 the, the input the distortion does happen because the input stage is being worked hard. If the gain of the of the amplifier before you close the feedback loop isn't high enough, and the type of distortion that you have, it's a typical it's a, it's a, it's a typically a, a third order. Uh, this distortion product, meaning that uh, that it it goes down with the cube of the amplitude, meaning that if you manage to increase the gain of the amplifier, the gain before feedback of your amplifier by a factor of ten, Tim will actually drop by a factor thousand, and of course that same factor ten will also buy you ten times more feedback. So uh, so there is th th there is actually a very very clear and disproportionate uh, um, um, inverse relationship between the amount of, uh, of feedback and Tim. Um, so, so it's the exact opposite of what what see. Tim is caused. It, t Tim happens when you've designed an amplifier with the intention of obtaining a lot of uh, a lot of feedback, and uh, and you've put uh, a differential input stage uh, in, in in front of it because of that. And then you failed to, uh, to to get that much feedback, and therefore, uh, thereby overloading the input stage. Gotcha. You know the the audio is coming in better now. I actually didn't do anything. This is a problem with Streamyard that I've noticed. That like the first fifteen or twenty minutes of our broadcast is choppy, and then somehow the system auto corrects. So I will be complaining with them after this broadcast. I just want everybody to know because I see some comments on that. So, Bruno, the other thing, I, I don't want to go off topic too much, but um, I always see people in the forum saying, well, why don't you do a square wave, see the square wave response of an amplifier? Is that really important to do? Because there's, an, there's a myth saying that if you have too much, too much feedback that you won't be, be able to pass a perfect square wave. It'll overshoot. Um, well, I mean, it's let, let, let's let's uh, let's put it that way. It's, a square wave is a is 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 in my view uh, a good sanity check to uh, to 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 see if, uh, if 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 your amplifier is capable of uh, of recovering quickly from sharp transients. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, I, I would say yeah, it's a, it's 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 perfectly sensible to do to to to, uh, to do that test. Now. I, um, I've, I've heard about this fear that that feedback causes this 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 this, this that it causes overshoot. That's actually one of the more realistic um, problems that are associated with uh, with trying to to, to 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 get more feedback. Let's say it's one of the challenges that you have to overcome. You you have to figure out ways of uh, of of, uh, uh, of uh, closing the feedback loop without uh with, with, without causing this uh, this over overshoot and, uh, and and ringing but simply saying oh i don't use feedback because i b because it'll cause overshoot and ringing well 
in that's that that's a bit defeatist i mean it's a bit like like like, like saying you're driving cross country from uh, from from new york to la and uh, and and somewhere near lincoln nebraska you 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 hit a sign that say it says road closed and you say oh that's too bad i'll, I'll, I'll better drive home again then that's 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 not how we, that's not how we do things in engineering and uh, is 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 yes potential instability is a challenge it's a potential roadblock um but it's it's eminently solvable um so what, all you have to do is knuckle down and do your homework yep yep Okay, so here we're talking about global feedback is actually a good thing. And for years, I was, you know, looking at the audio press, and they're all saying global feedback is bad. You want to do all, you want to do all of your feedback locally, and do not have a global feedback loop. It's yeah, that it's it's kind of a it's it's kind of a typical pattern that 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 sort of besets the the, the whole the whole feedback discussion. At, Everyone sorts probably has 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 a a point where 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 they sort of run into trouble, and then rather than saying like, well, I've I've run into trouble here, they'll just say, oh, doing that is bad. Global feedback is a, is is actually a classical case, because um, because as I said, the the, the the sort of the the most sort of the first way that people found to to get more feedback in a in a in a in a, in a given bandwidth. Um, is uh, is to combine local feedback with global feedback, and the two the the the, the, the two loops just uh, ju just multiply or they add up in the uh, in, in decibels. Um, and uh, but you can get the exact same amount of gain in a global feedback loop. The only thing is there's a, there, there, there's a, just a, a few small catches in the way that you construct that, uh, that 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 loop that are easily forgotten. So it's very easy to construct. To try and construct a global feedback loop that goes unstable if you simply if if you simply forget a few minor things. Um, so 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 in so um, global feedback isn't isn't evil. It's just the more challenging way of uh, of of doing things. But it's also, in my view, the best way because it puts every single stage. Of the amplifier in one loop, and every single stage has its distortion reduced by the exact by the exact uh, same amount. Whereas if you do it with a local and global combo, it's only the output stage that actually sees the uh, see, sees the the effect of the uh, of the uh, uh, of of the full feedback loop. Whereas other parts of the amplifier might only see the uh, the, the, the small amount of loop gain afforded by the uh, by, 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 by the global portion you know bruno what's one thing i'm just thinking about that's interesting is when people give feedback a bad rap in power amplifiers they often forget about their dacs you know the digital the analog converters also use a lot of feedback to get their low distortion and linear uh numbers why why do they not think about that in when it's in a dac I, circuit but they worry about I, it's in an amplifier circuit well i, I think because if 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 it's a DAC, I I suspect it's it's simply kind of uh, it, it it it's simply a dark art. But the let's say the most the most extreme case of that is uh, is 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 one bit D to A conversion, uh, aka ESD, which is actually very very much liked uh, by the, by the, uh, the 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 same the same part of the audiophile population that might have trouble with uh, with uh, negative feedback but dsd or one bit sigma delta to give it its proper name uh, is essentially the most extreme case of negative feedback that you can think of it is an unbelievable amount of feedback that is placed around something which is unbelievably nonlinear, and the result works just perfectly um and it's it's essentially how how all modern D to A converters work. Not th these days; they no longer work with just one bit. They they'll typically use, use five or six. But nevertheless, that thing is so phenomenally nonlinear uh, that the only reason why it achieves such uh, such uh, high audio performance is because a, a delta sigma um, a converter is nothing but a quantizer with a with a with a with a with a feedback loop around it that's got a fantastic amount of gain. 
You see that guy, hear that guy. So if you're an audiophile that loves SACD, um, you can't be against feedback because you're listening to a ton of feedback anytime you listen to an SACD. Only way the system works. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> correct. So what's going on here? I see a bunch of uh, graphs here. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, correct. It's, it, 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 it. Uh, I wrote, uh, I, uh, I sketched the, so that, that the graph in in uh, in in response to, uh, to 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 a query about is it true that negative feedback um, uh, sort of uh, adds uh, higher harmonics? And the thing there is, well, is 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 well, uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's a grain of truth there. Um, but the grain of truth is actually uh, is, is 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 actually it's mathematically beautiful, but it's uh, but but it's a bit confusing, because what actually happens if you have an amplifier and it has a sort of an inherent nonlinearity, which currently I've 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 I've, I've drawn on the left, it's like a par a, a parabola, parabola. So looking mm -hmm. at, uh, at 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 a, at a pure second order nonlinearity, and and so I've, I've drawn the the distortion spectrum there. Um, as fundamental and it's second harmonic and for complete mistake it's zeroth harmonic which uh, which which is is, is uh, too often for, uh, too often forgotten and then if you start putting feedback around that and you th you think that through what it actually means in terms of the of the distortion residual that ends up at the amplifier actually the feedback loop will again as i said at the start of the talk it will actually Make the circuit do the opposite of, um, of 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 what it does before you close the loop. Um, so the first thing that happens when you close the feedback loop is that is that parabola flips over to become uh, to, to to become like a shifted square root function, and then the feedback loop will start straightening it out. Um, but uh, but 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 the, the but of course uh, a square root does not have simply a second harmonic. It also has a third and fourth and a fifth and, and 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 so on. So if you started with an amplifier that 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 implausibly had only a perfect second order nonlinearity, and then you, you and then you close a feedback loop and you sort of slowly turn up the the the, the, the loop gain, you do indeed see these higher harmonics turn up, and then as you and, and then when you continue increasing the loop gain, the whole packet. Will uh, will will start uh, start coming down as a as a, um, as a block, but this this observation that you that that with a bit of uh, feedback you immediately see these high harmonics um, uh, popping up has been used to argue again against uh, negative feedback. But this, the best counter argument that I can give is well, why not? What if you'd started off with an amplifier whose nonlinearity by sheer chance had been this uh, the, 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 this square root. First thing that would have happened is would have it would have uh, flipped over to a perfect second order uh, order function, and all the higher harmonics would have would have actually uh, disappeared much more quickly than the uh, that than the amount of loop gain would have uh, would, 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 would 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 have made you expect. So, on the whole, with realistic circuitry, um, you get neither extreme. Most realistic circuitry has a mishmash of uh, of distortion products and uh, and and uh, and feedback uh, uh, will 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 first flip that over to a different mishmash before it then starts reducing the whole the 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 the, the, the whole thing uh, the, the whole thing down. That's all. So so in 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 my view, um, using. Um, Using a perfect second order nonlinearity and then arguing this this in order to give give feedback a bad name is is as close to disingenuous as you can get. So I think we need to to repeat back what Bruno has just said here, actually, because this is a really common comment that we hear. It it stems from a particular well known uh, amp designer who is somewhat anti feedback, who has stated that as you increase feedback, you increase higher order harmonics. What you're saying is that would only be true in basically an extreme case in which an amplifier is behaving in a very unusual way where it only has this second order nonlinearity. In practice with real amps, that's not true. You don't see a, a rise in higher order harmonics, correct? You're saying you see a reduction in all harmonics. Correct. So you see, you see, you see, you see a, a somewhat subtle change in, in, in the overall spectrum. 
um, but but you don't see you, you, but real but uh, let's say more realistic circuits do not do something spectacular like uh, li like like go from having no high order products to having a have, uh, having a ton of them or vice or, 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 or vice versa. Actually, the um, the the, uh, the 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 point to my best knowledge was actually first made um, by Peter Baxendall. Um, again, in the in in the seventies, I think he, he was the first one to 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 make this uh, the, the, uh, this observation um, about uh, about the 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 addition of new uh, higher order components in case of a of a perfect uh, second order uh, nonlinearity. And Peter Baxendall actually was by no means uh, uh, against negative feedback, but his argument has been taken out of context by uh, by by, by uh, other other people um unfortunately yeah this is a common theme in audio i mean it's a common theme in anything but we see this in audio all the time especially with the cable vendors where they'll take a a, a, a sliver of truth and just blow it out into a mass hysteria of, well, it's, of non-reality it's, it's well it's it's easy it's uh, it's easier to do that than to do a feedback loop so well <laughs> that's funny Okay, so now we're doing feedback loops, class A, B versus class D. So class D being the high efficiency designs that uh, you specialize in. But I mean, you have had to have done a lot of A, B stages before you moved on to class D. Am I correct? It's it, it's actually kind of a kind of a mix because when we're, 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 I actually class D appeared on my radar when I was sixteen, and uh, and from that point onwards, I always felt like oh, I I want to know to know more about about those things. But while I was doing that, I was also toying around with valve amplifiers and with uh, with with linear amplifiers. Uh, so cl class A B amplifiers as, uh, as well as sort of to give myself a, a well-rounded audio education. Uh, so, um, but um, but but the, uh, the 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 interesting class D also ties in very strongly with another interest that I have in A to D and D to A version. Uh, so. As you, as you might know, if I've, I've, uh, I've, I've done a couple of, uh, of, of fully discrete A to D and D to A converters in the in, in, in the past, and that's really because uh, be, be, because these two technologies have so so many uh, have, have so many similarities, especially in terms of the the whole feedback and uh, and and and, and, and con control thing. And I found that actually the, the, the same thing happens uh, happens with most most people that I meet in in, in the in the class D field is that they that that they say the most knowledgeable among them always have sort of, sort of one leg in the uh, in the converter field as well. Um, I mean, they go uh, hand in hand, so it, it's all about getting the best feedback to linearize the system. Do you think um, Do you think we're at a point now? Because I've noticed over the last couple of years just how good Class D has become. Do you think we're at the point now where Class D could replace Class A B amplifiers in in the power stages? I mean, are we at the point now where we have enough just linearity? We have enough load invariant um, design where a, a Class D amplifier will sound similar regardless of what speaker is being driven. We have enough power capability now compared to Class A B. In fact, sometimes we have more power capability with Class D just because of the sheer efficiency of it. Do you think we're at that stage now where the Class D technology is mature enough to be on the same footing or better than the best of the Class A B? Well, I think um, uh, uh, let, 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 let's say. Um... So, so it's it's it, it's it's a bit difficult to be uh, to, to be seen as uh, seen as being uh, um, objective here, of course. Uh, what with me being uh, being a class D guy, but um, the easiest thing you can do is simply uh, look at uh, the measured performance of the uh, of of, of the, uh, the the uh, best class D amplifiers and compare them with the measured performance of the best linear amplifiers. I mean, those figures don't don't lie at this point the best class d amplifiers have actually have actually sailed past the the best linear amplifiers uh in terms of output impedance in terms of uh, uh of, of distortion um and uh, all i can then say is well certainly to my ears uh the uh the 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 the, the 
the subjective performance simply reflects that there's there's no there's uh, as usual I mean, there's there's no there's no mystery anyway we we, we uh, it's it, it, let's say it, i think um i think we all agree that 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 once you get to extremely good performance all round with, uh, with 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 all sorts of tests then basically that shows that the amplifier is as douglas self used to call it uh, blameless um, and we are at that point. Uh, we are definitely at, at, at that point, uh, especially because designers of linear amplifiers have not really kept up. Um, they've, they've not really um, they, 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 they've not really pushed. Uh, they, they've not really um, well, pushed the envelope of performance. Like not exactly. Or, it's or, almost or, like the analogy you use between, and, I, and I'm an internal combustion guy still because I love driving my Beamer, but um, we're at the point now where electric cars are are exceeding what a DC, what a regular uh, combustion engine can do. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. the it's just the cost factor now that's really keeping us from going full electric with everything. But I kind of see that now with Class D versus Class AB because literally, if we would have had this discussion ten years ago, Bruno. When I was measuring some of these Class D amplifiers on the market, I was laughing. I mean, I looked at some of the ones that were being put in AV receivers where they would either shut down or would only do about a third of the power at four ohms. Uh, most of them had really poor post-filter feedback or they, uh, their impedance would radically change depending on – or the frequency response would radically change depending on the load they were driving. So what the hell happened from 10 years ago to now – that's made class D catch up and sometimes surpass AB designs. Is it all about the feedback or is it about the output devices are faster or a combination of the both? It's Bruno. It's, it's all Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's mostly feedback. Um, uh, because the, 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 the most, most robust power devices, the ones that I still like to use in, 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 in my current crop of amplifiers, uh, actually, date from the early 2000s. So, um, so, so I mean, there there are there are faster output devices um, uh, out there, but uh, but the, the, this 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 is not uh, this is not going to make uh, to, to make a, f a fundamental difference. It is really about the about the negative feedback. Uh, now, of course, um, I could I could of course mildly chide you for the uh, for 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 for, uh, for for not having measured enough class the amplifiers then because actually. Ever since the mid two thousands, um, there were amplifiers that had uh, had a, a, a solidly load invariant frequency response uh, um, or, uh, already, but they they weren't that widespread, of course, but they existed. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, the, the, the general answer to your question: yes, it is the control theory because um, or, or, the, or the feedback because. Um, I still recall the the the, the days um, when when uh, people didn't even think it was possible at all to include the output filter in the in in the feedback loop. The output filter, I mean, it's an, it's understandable why it looks hard. The output filter has a, uh, produces a phase shift of, uh, of 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 180 degrees anywhere from from its uh, from its corner frequency up. So the initial response that you have when you see that is well that's all my phase margin eaten up there and then i i can't i can't do anything any uh, 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 anymore and um and just finding fi finding out uh, how to how to get around that is what was was just uh, was, was 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 just a phenomenal triumph and there was a handful of People who independently from each other all found a couple of different ways of doing that, but they all boiled down roughly to the same thing, um, which was uh, which which was basically undo ninety of the one hundred and eighty degrees, and then and and then you can uh, and, and 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 then you can continue with a with a, a more or less along more or less uh, traditional lines. Um, and then the the other thing which uh, let's say the the other penny which only dropped a couple of uh, a couple of years ago was that um, the so-called self-oscillating amplifiers, which is the type of class the amplifier that doesn't have 
a physical oscillator driving the, uh, the the PWM, but which just oscillates of its own accord. That type of amplifier um, is inherently much more easier and, and much more robust to control uh, using uh, uh, using feedback and uh, and that understanding and getting more and more comfortable with this uh, with, with, with this uh, somewhat uh, quirky type of, uh, of, of, of circuit has, uh, has, has, has made an enormous difference. You know, and I'm surprised today um, when we're dealing with immersive surround sound and we're dealing, uh, a lot of the receivers are coming out with nine channels built in. <laughs> Some of them have up to 13 channels of amplification. Why more haven't moved towards a good class D implementation. There's only like one major brand that's doing that, which is the pioneer one. And now they use the D3 module. They used to use the ice module. And back in the day, mm -hmm. the ice module had some limitations that I measured. Um, do you think it's, do you think it's a stigma that these companies are worried about audiophiles rejecting class D or do you think it's a cost implementation that it's still cheaper to do a linear amp as opposed to doing these class D modules in a, in a budget type of Avery receiver, like a thousand dollar, $1,500 receiver. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've been trying to work that one out because it, funnily enough, uh, a class D has actually bec become more accepted in the esoteric high end market than in the AV market, which is which is kind of funny because in the AV market people, in 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 general, aren't aren't that religious about uh, about the the means that are deployed to uh, to achieve the end. I noticed that when when we when we posted the announcement for this chat on the forum, um, the, the, the 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 forum this discussion was was more or less everyone going like, yeah, so what? Use feedback if that's what you need. Uh, we we just want an amplifier that works. Um, which I have to say is, is was was quite heartening, um, uh, but um, when I talk to some of these AV companies, they'll say something like, "Oh, but class D class D amplifiers aren't good enough yet." Then you ask, "Have you heard? Company? Have you heard of that technology?" And the answer is always no. So essentially, they've just decided that it's not good enough, and uh, and and they haven't really been uh, been been on the lookout either. It's it's. It's it's the best hypothesis that I have for this uh, for, for for this fairly unusual, fairly, fairly curious phenomenon. Well, we're going to be talking more about this topic, Bruno. I'd like to have you on again and and do, talk more amplifier stuff. If you guys want to check out some of Bruno's recent designs, commercially available, I think NAD has a couple of models now that implement the Purify uh, amp module that you came up with. Am I correct with that? It's not out yet, but they do have they one product. They okay. have they have one product with uh, with the with the purify uh, module. Uh, do you know module which one that is? I'd have to look it up. It's actually like a streaming integrated amp kind of all it's, in it's one called, device. It's, it's called the M the M thirty three. There you go. Yeah, yeah, okay. and uh, so and but and they and they they, they they but their previous generation of the master series use use N core, which is uh, which is like like my, uh, my my previous generation of amplifiers, which uh, which uh, still does me proud. I have to say so. Um, yeah, they're all so, NAD has so, so they're very expensive. But Bruno, it's not because you're charging them too much, right? They just need to make more of them, and we need to start buying them. Essentially, yeah, it's 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 purely it's it's purely a matter of uh, of, of economy of scale. Um, that, but the, the, so the, if if someone if if someone decided to make like um, like like a nice little stereo amplifier with absolute top notch performance, and uh, and and they made the decision up front to stack them high and sell them cheap then you could easily do that um but it's just that that in a in 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 the, in a market that that's the, where, where you want to sell those those quantities even the tiny difference in cost that you can that you can save to uh by 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 by, uh, by shaving off a lot of the performance um makes the app makes it very often makes the product more saleable so it's 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 uh it it's it's purely that that I'm I'm just my my wet dream is some 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 very big consumer order con conglomerate uh, knocking on my thing like like, like look we want to make a hundred thousand of these uh, uh, can uh, can you help and then we can make a hundred a uh, hundred thousand really cheap really really good amplifiers. 
Well, All right, I'm gonna, so I'm going to send this. I'm going to send this video to Sound United. Yeah, so they're already interested, but they're trying to put it in their next Moran's reference grade. We need to convince them that that's not what people want. They want to see their Moran's, their Denon receivers, all the way down to like 500 bucks using these things. Pre precisely, it's it's it's. I mean, it's it's silly. The price between. In, in circuit terms, the price between uh, but, 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 but the price difference between bet, between an absolutely unbelievably good amplifier and a, a CR uh, CR multiplied by P uh, amplifier <laughs> um, is is like is like a couple of bucks. It's really a tiny it, the, the, the 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 amount of money that goes into in in, in, in just doing a very nice uh, efficient uh, fee feedback loop. It's not a lot. It's 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 it's, an, it's like a, an extra dual op amp and a smattering of passives. That's all you need. Um, because I mean the, the the math. I've done it. It was hard work, but I've done it. And so from now on, it's it's for free. Nice. You know, Matt, you bring up Marantz. It's funny because I used to have the Marantz PM11 S3 uh, integrated mm -hmm. amp, which is a class AB, really nice piece. They have now the replacement to that. I think it's called the P10 or P11. Mm -hmm. It's like twice the price, but it's twice the power. I thought they were just bridging two channels to it, but then I found out that they're actually using a class D amp in it. I think so, it's a Encore. Is that right, Bruno? Is it it's one it's an Encore. That's that's yeah. Uh, yeah that, that's but what they don't even mind, talk yeah. about that in their. If nope. you go on their website, it's it's silent. You think it's still a class A B, but it's. Should but should should they talk about that? Um, um, I, I've always taken the, the, taken the, the the position. I mean, commercially even that that if if uh, if if people um, people buy my modules, and this was was as true for for the, during my Hypex days as it is my, my purified is if people want to quiet about what they what they uh, that they use because they feel that uh, that that that's that, that that'll make life easier for them to uh, to, to bring product to market that's all right um we, we don't we we we, we, we don't we, we don't have to uh, to to use our customers to to hawk our wares yeah well guys i hope you enjoyed this this has ran over an hour so i think we're going to wrap this up but we are going to be publishing a very long version of the feedback article that Bruno wrote. I published a 500 word summary last week on audiohogs.com. It's linked down below in this video. So next week, I'm going to publish the long form for anybody that wants to go through all the math because Bruno certainly spent a lot of time doing that. And I know that this is kind of, you know, very finite details that most people aren't interested in, but it's nice to have this documented. You know, we're living in an era of fake news and I like to bring out the truth and the science of audio when we can. So Bruno, I really appreciate you being here. We definitely want to have you back on the channel. Matt, it was awesome having you here in the discussion as well. So guys, make sure you thumb this video up. Make sure you, you hit the subscribe button if you haven't. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. I'll be putting all these slide presentations there for your access in case you want to go over this when you watch the video again. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Bye. Man, that audio.